Hey, welcome back to STV. On this week's show, it's all about the tech. We've got a 40th anniversary Apex in the shop that's getting a new set of Elkas. Then we're going to take it to accelerated technologies and totally geek out with John about suspension setups. We're also going to have a look at Camso's new Storm 150 track, and we've got a 50th anniversary Apex warming up for a burn. So let's start turning wrenches. STD has been brought to you by Yamaha. Conquer snow with Yamaha. Ford F-Series, Canada's best-selling line of trucks for 52 years. Tough, smart, capable. Kimpex, fueled by fun. Upgrading the suspension on your machine can be and should be much more than just buying a set of shocks and bolting them up to your buggy. In the aftermarket, there's tons of options out there from cookie cutter replacements to top of the line units like this Elka that are each individually built for you, your machine and your riding style. Elka has been providing aftermarket shocks since 2000 for the off-road market and in just the last couple of years have taken that knowledge and experience and applied it to the snow. Elka shocks are more than just direct replacements. Each shock, starting with their stage one units, are calibrated to your personal weight and the sled you ride. Think of it like this, the OEs, they gotta take a shotgun approach when designing shocks and springs for their sleds because they need units that are gonna perform with all kinds of rider weights and riding styles, where Elka, on the other hand, they can zero in on these variables with rifle type accuracy. The shocks we've chosen to install on this 2008 Yamaha Apex GT are a set of stage four units for the front suspension and a stage two mono shock for the rear. This package was custom designed and ordered through Accelerated Technologies, one of Elka's dealers here in Ontario. The front remote reservoir stage four units have Elka's low speed compression adjustment with internal high speed bleed off for those big hits and rebound dampening for controlling the extension after the hit. The rear shock is a simpler stage two unit with adjustable rebound damping only. They're more of a direct OE replacement and fit better inside the skid. Now, even though they don't have all the adjustability of the front suspension, they don't need it because they come with springs and a valve solution to match the weight of the owner. Additionally, the rear only has one job to do, hold the rear of the machine up, where the fronts have to not only hold the sled up, but deal with steering it as well. The additional adjustability up front will help fine tune the suspension to the ever changing trail conditions, maximizing performance. The mix and match of stages also helps a bit in the budget department because Elka shocks are a premium addition to any sled. They're not cheap, but when you see this quality of craftsmanship and consider that each shock is built just for you, you can understand that these babies are pricey, but worth it. And hey, it's snowmobiling. Nothing is cheap about snowmobiling. And at the end of the day, Elka and their dealers want to build a package that works for you as a rider within your budget. I've had the Apex for just about a year now, and what drew me to it is uh, I've had uh, vectors and I've had a nitro, so it was a four-stroke, three-cylinder, and I thought maybe it's time to uh, get the extra cylinder. I had a 2010 vector, had about 9,000 kilometers on it, um, and the one before that I had about 9,000 kilometers, so um, it's 18,000 kilometers six winters on uh, the same motor. So I thought maybe I'm gonna go to the top of the food chain now and get the Apex, the big dog. I didn't quite like the uh, suspension. Um, I found it a little heavier and uh, it wasn't as good on the Sunday afternoon and the rough stuff. I decided to choose the Elka suspension to upgrade the Apex because uh, I've seen the ads and uh, it looks like quality. Uh, I researched it and uh, they're relatively new in the snowmobile industry and uh, I want to try it. Something that's new and something that's quality. I think it's going to make a big difference having the adjustability to uh, my riding style and riding conditions.
The addition of an aftermarket suspension can breathe life into an old sled like this Apex. Let's face it, sometimes the only difference between a low-end model and a high-end model or year over year is the suspension, so a mod like this one can make that old buggy feel new again. Coming up a little later on in the show, we're going to take the Apex back to Accelerated Technologies to have John give us a hand setting up this machine, but also some advice tuning our sleds no matter what we ride. In recent snowmobile history, there have been a number of milestone sleds, and one of those machines was Yamaha's RX-1, the first performance four-stroke to hit the market. Now looking back, it did have a few shortcomings, but with it, Yamaha proved that a four-stroke could be much more than a simple, lazy, slow touring sled. That was 2003. 15 years on, and the DNA of the RX-1 is still with us. When the RX-1 hit the snow, it was the same year the Rev was available to the general riding public. We all know how the Rev changed the way we rode snowmobiles, moving us away from the relaxed, stretched out position to a much more rider forward design that has continued to be refined even on current models. It didn't take long for Yamaha to make attempts to move the riding position of the RX-1 forward as much as they could with seats and bars, but they were limited with what they could do with the mechanical dimensions of the chassis. Even when the Apex was introduced, the new bodywork helped with the riding position, but there were still challenges with the mechanical layout. You can still see that history today. The side profile of the Apex has the same basic layout as the RX-1, but that doesn't mean it was wrong. The Yamaha RX-1 and then the Apex was simply an older style layout that worked for years as the preferred riding position. And even today, there's plenty of riders who appreciate the more stretched out layout of the Apex. The fact is, you can still hustle pretty good on an Apex. You just have to ride it with a hang your ham attitude, meaning you slide half your butt off the side of the seat to weight the inside of the tunnel. The more rider forward designs have you leaning your upper body forward towards the spindle to weight the sled properly. In fact, a lot of people prefer this stretched out layout design for long distance touring, and that's the niche the Apex fits into. It's exceptionally good at big trails with long sweeping corners not so good at the tight twisty stuff. So if your destinations take you to the big trails, you can't get much better than an Apex. And then you got that four cylinder sound to listen to. Back in the day, these machines had that throaty street bike type of sound that was a huge appeal of the RX-1. This sound alone sold countless of these machines and I personally believe without this type of performance sound, the RX-1s wouldn't have been as popular as they were. The Apex still has that sound, but maybe it's the way my memory works. It could be exactly the same, but I think the old RX-1 sounded better. But regardless, 2018 is the end of that signature sound. At least these sleds will be heard on the trails for a long time yet, reminding those of us who are around when the first RX-1s hit the trails and how that sound paved the way for the 200 plus four strokes of today. Understanding where the Apex fits is an important part of figuring out whether or not the Apex works for your riding style and where you ride. If it is, the Apex is an excellent sled to ride and that's partly due to the good genes, but also a continued refinement of the sled by Yamaha. Features like power steering and chassis dampeners have simply made this sled better. Even this year, the last year in its production, Yamaha continues development with additions like Yamaha's reactive suspension system, which hydraulically connects the two front shock absorbers through an adjustable control unit. Think of it as an adjustable hydraulic sway bar. When the outside ski starts to compress because of the lateral body roll putting pressure on the outside shock, it transfers that energy to the inside shock, essentially retracting it, countering the body roll and inside ski lift. You could accomplish the same thing with a stiffer sway bar, but with stiff sway bars comes harsh ride when one ski hits a bump. Controlling the sway bar effect hydraulically means this coupling can be tuned and managed to provide the roll stiff that's needed for sweeping corners, but compliant enough to absorb the trail. I'm no fortune teller, 
but my crystal ball is telling me that this system is going to see use in the Yamaha lineup beyond the end of the Apex. While the front suspension is still largely RX1 influenced, the rear suspension has seen some major changes over the years with model year 18 sleds back with the 129 single shot rear suspension. It features a single Fox Float 3 piggyback shock carrying the entire weight of the rear. While this system saves weight, about 10 pounds over the old model shock system, it's a bit of a debate as to whether or not it's an improvement despite the 10 pound weight savings. Last on my list of features is the 50th anniversary graphics package gracing the side of the Apex. Perhaps trying to save the best to last, Yamaha seems determined to send the Apex into history on a high note. I for one believe they did, because if you have to own an Apex, this is the Apex to own. If not now, then in 20 years, because this sled is going to be one of the classics. You don't have to be a Yamaha fan to recognize the impact the RX-1 and now ending with the 50th anniversary Apex have had on the snowmobiling world. Because if we didn't have sleds like these, we wouldn't have sleds like these. suspension setups on snowmobiles, do you find people are taking the time to do it? No. To, to, and to generalize, a lot of people will own a snowmobile from its birth to, they set, to the time they sell it and never touch it. They, they assume sometimes that the dealer has, has set it up for them and often they will tell their dealer their weight or riding style and the dealer in their defense are very busy going through the process of getting that snowmobile to the owner and they often don't have the expertise too and the, with staff turnover and, and in the industry they don't have the, the expertise to really do a fantastic job of setting that thing up for the customer. They may uh, put in the appropriate spring if the rider is over 200, 250 pounds kind of thing uh, or they may just generally up the preload on the torsion springs if, uh, if it's that model equipped. Um, but yeah, in terms of specific knowledge on, on the nuances of the setups, that's where, uh, where we can help them, we find. For the average snowmobiler, is setting up a suspension on their sled something difficult to do? I don't want to say difficult, but, but there are definitely some hints and some, you know, hopefully we can offer that today. We can give them some direction in how to, how to set up, uh, what kind of rider are they, what are they looking for from their snowmobile, and, and point them in that direction on, on what to turn, what to twist, what to set where kind of thing. Can they see an improvement? Uh -huh. Yes, they can see massive improvement. You know, uh, I don't want to say unfortunately, but often we, we get involved when they're at wit's end, they're pulling their hair out, or, or they've complained enough to the dealer that the dealer has directed them here. And, uh, you know, they're, we've, we've saved many a, a sale. You know, we've had uh, ladies and guys come in here saying, I am selling this thing if I can't get it to meet my expectations. They don't use those words, but, um, and, and we, uh, we interview them, we ask them what it's doing, why, what, what are they looking for in that snowmobile, and, and how is it letting them down? And then we, we, we can target that and make huge improvements. The next thing, and perhaps the most important thing, is, is the parallelity of the skid frame. We put the, we'll put the chassis right on the shop floor, not on dollies. Uh, we'll put the carbides and the, and the track right on the floor and we'll lift up on the back of the snowmobile and we'll kind of get our eyeball in there and watch. After we've set the ski shock preload, we watch how that skid comes down. And eight, nine times out of 10, the front of the skid will come down first. And you can often wave a two by four under the back of the skid uh, before it will actually come down and, and touch. And when that situation occurs, we've got a sled that is very, very prone to excessive weight transfer. It'll, it'll dart on the brakes. Uh, as soon as you touch the throttle, it'll squat back and it'll want to run straight. It won't finish a corner. A lot of people will complain on the, on the exit, on the way out when I'm on throttle, the sled will, will understeer. It will go straight. And often that is a, 
a setting on the center shock, a combination of the limiter strap and the center shock preload is set improperly. And it's a dangerous snowmobile when, when that's way out of whack. For the STV Apex project sled that we're working on, we, we selected the Stage 4 Ski Shock. The Stage 4 Ski Shock from Elka uh, is an external piggyback reservoir shock. And when we have a piggyback reservoir, it permits us to have compression tuning, compression adjustability. We also selected the Stage 4 has rebound. The Stage 3 does not. It's compression or just only shock absorber. Having rebound allows us to to control the recovery of the shock after a bump. Having rebound adjustability allows you to really optimize it. If the sled is, is uh, used on a Sunday when the railway lines are really beat up and it's very chattery, we can recommend opening the rebound so that the ski or the, or the rear shock can come up over the bump and quickly get it back down for the next one. And that will isolate the chassis. It will allow the ski or the skid to move quickly, easily, independently under the rider, so we're isolating them from the bumps. If the rebound is too slow, then the chassis will ratchet down or pack down, and then it will start to smack off of the bumps. And we've all felt that in our hands, maybe your feet bouncing on the running boards when you're going down that beat up railway line uh, or trail, you're just, you're getting hit. And, and the rebound allows you to fine tune that on a flat, smooth, super smooth groom trail, and we've all been there, we can actually slow the rebound down so that we, we limit or we control the body roll. So your enjoyment goes up, your, your confidence goes up, and your, your speed can go up. You know, we don't endorse that, but, but we, we want it to be a safe platform for the rider. It's a big consideration. When, when, a, when the owner of an older snowmobile is looking at a $2,000, a $3,000, a $4,000 shock package, hey, that's, that's an, a massive investment. The, the riders will notice a huge improvement. You know, a, an older sled, when you go up to a shock package like something offered from Elka, you're, you're oftentimes leapfrogging the best package from the OEM. So you can, you can theoretically get a better working snowmobile than a brand new one. So in terms of the investment, in terms of the cost and the return on investment, it, it is a great great way to, to, to spend some money on your snowmobile. You will be blown away on how much better it's going to work when, when you've taken the time and the money to, to put a shock package in your snowmobile. So after a day in the shop with John learning some tricks about suspension setup and getting the inside scoop on how these Elkas work on this Apex, this machine is an absolute baller to ride on the snow. I think the original owner is going to be really happy to get this sled back, but I'm not ready to give it up just yet. Bye bye Hi, I'm Larry Tyser. Welcome to another installment of Lawn Ornaments, where viewers submit their finds of snowmobiles left behind. Let's take a look at today's winner. This one's coming in from Bill and Judy Hazer. I mean, what's going on here? We got water, rocks, snowmobile. I mean, there's a fire in the back or a ramp. I think they should just light it on fire and launch it anyways, but I mean, we should stack some canoes, maybe jump over those tractors and land in the water. I don't know. Do something, just gonna send it anyways. All right, Billy and Judy, I'm gonna send you guys this t-shirt so you guys can keep on sending it. Snowmobile tracks are something that we don't think about too much on our sledge, much beyond lug height and length anyways, but there's a ton of tech going on in here that's helping to build a better snowmobile experience for all of us. And one of the companies that's continually striving to build a better mousetrap is Camso, and their latest mousetrap is the Storm 150. Built for performance trail riders, this is a track upgrade over anything else on the snow. Even Camso themselves say this beast is better than their flagship track, the Ripsaw, which has been spinning around many of the top OE sleds rear suspensions for years. The new Storm 150 incorporates three key new features. 
the first of which is two different lug heights across the traction face of the track. The inner lugs are 1.5 inches tall while the outer lugs are an inch and a quarter. This helps the track roll just that little bit in tight corners while still providing more lug contact and traction throughout the turn. Second, that center, higher lug, is cupped to help scoop the snow resulting in better acceleration across all types of snow conditions, almost providing crossover type capabilities out of a short track. And third, the internal support columns are engineered to provide the best backbone needed to support these lugs. This rigidity is balanced through all conditions for the best acceleration and braking possible. To tell you about what this track is like to ride on the snow, Camso brought Levi Lavalley out to ride it. So here's what he had to say about it. The new Storm 150 was awesome on the trail. The new cup design in the center lug, it really was awesome on the straights. The inner lugs, they're taller so that you can really hook up under acceleration. The inch and a quarter outside lug is actually an awesome idea. It allows it to actually turn better so you can kind of roll it onto its edge if you want. That's what's really neat is the two lug design. It allows you to be even more versatile out on the trail. One of the things that make this track work as well as it does is the support columns. The support columns are, are so rigid that it really keeps those lugs firm and under braking, the support columns are holding those lugs stiff and that's what's helping you slow down. I mean, without those, I don't, I don't know the track would work as well as it does. The off-trail capabilities of the Storm 150, <laughs> I was super surprised. You can go and you can carve, hook up, and actually get yourself around. It's amazing how well it would bite in and really, really pull you through some of that deep powder. I mean, the track is just so versatile. It's really one of a kind. So that's it for this week's go around of STV. Until next week, I hope you get to make some tracks in the snow. I know I will. We'll go in a bit, Bear. <laughs>